Well, good morning. Zeal. <laughs> you know, the definition is zeal for or against. Affect. Covet earnestly. Have. Desire. Move with. Envy. Be jealous over. You know, I, I was looking at some other versions, and one of them interpreted that word zeal, zotus, as enthusiastic. But I think it has more depth than enthusiastic. I think it comes from your inner being. Something that, that drives you. Zeal is like an overpowering, burning, earnest desire that protects what is desired with envy like jealousy. It could come across as psychotic. You know, a person that has, has zeal not to get contaminated. They may carry a, a thing of cloths with them so that when they touch door handles that, that they don't get germs. They may even have uh, an extra two, two hand sanitizers with them in their purse for good measure. You know, some churches are on, the, on page with this and they have these hand sanitizing stations right at the greeting station. You know, that's, that's about the place where you need it, right? You know, where you shake hands. Uh, you know, I, I, I could just see the greeter. You know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not thinking Lloyd does this because he doesn't need a hand sanitizer. But, but good morning, you know, and he hands you the bulletin. Hands you the bulletin and, and he says, how are you doing? And he goes to the greeting and then, you know, after he gets done shaking hands, you know, little squirt here. Okay, everything's all right. And ready for his next group. And so he says, good morning, how are you doing? Oh, you were sick this week, uh, your family. Oh, really? You know, a few more squirts, you know, you're ready to go. Oh, you went on a missions trip this week uh, to help the poor and needy. And yeah, really? Oh, good to see you. Just welcome to our church, you know. And by that time, he's, he's got his... He's all the way up to his elbows, man. He's looking like he's ready for surgery. Zeal. Please, let's turn to Acts 21, 17. You know, sometimes environments can, can instigate zeal. You know, some people are, are passive. But you get them in the right environment with the right people. And boom chakalaka. <laughs> They're passionate. You know? Churches can become a fix for zeal. The fellowship may encourage you to be zealous for God. The worship may instigate a zeal for God. And I hope that's what happens. Zeal is really a neutral experience. <coughs> You know, not that it's neutral in passion, but it's neutral in the sense that it can either be a good zeal or a bad zeal. Paul said in the scripture reading this morning that, that Kent read, it is fine to be zealous, provided the purpose is good, and to be so always, not just when I am with you, so you see, if you find yourself zealous, test to see if that zealous purpose is good. Test to see if, if, if that zeal is something that is, is just a happening in your life. You know, when the circumstances are right, or if it's something that's stable, and it's a burning desire within you, and you, it, it's, it's hanging with you all the time. You know, as we move to this next part in Acts 21... Paul arrives in Jerusalem to be welcomed. Paul had a reputation, though, of, of mingling with the Gentiles. Now, if you know anything about Gentiles and Jews, the Jews thought the Gentiles were dogs. They were low life. And Paul had this, this reputation that not only was he mingling with these Gentiles, telling them about God's Word, but he was also asking Jews to do the same. 
The brothers in Jerusalem, though, as he came to Jerusalem, remember all those warnings about when you go to Jerusalem, you're going to have all kinds of trouble. Well, he comes to Jerusalem and they warmly welcomed Paul. But they were careful to explain that there were thousands of Jewish believers that were zealous for the law. Now, they might have had a hand sanitation Say, ha, a, a type of hand sanitation station nearby. You know, just because this was Paul, the Jew, or the, the Gentile mingler. And they even urged Paul to purify himself. Well, let's read it in Acts 21, start with verse 17. When we arrived at Jerusalem, the brothers received us warmly. The next day, Paul and the rest of us went to see James, and all the elders were present. Paul greeted them and reported in detail what God had, been do what God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. When they heard this, they praised God. And then they said to Paul, You see, brother, how many thousands of Jews have believed, and all of them are zealous for the law. They have been informed that you teach all the Jews who live among the Gentiles to turn away from Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or live according to our customs. What shall we do? They certainly will hear that you have come. So do what we tell you to do. There are four men with us who have made a vow. Take these men, join in their purification rites, and pay their expenses so that they can have their heads shaved. Then everybody will know there is no truth to these reports about you, but that you yourself are living in obedience to the law. As for the Gentile believers, we have written to them our decision that they should abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from meats of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. And the next day, Paul took the men and purified himself along with them. Then he went to the temple to give notice of the date when the days of purification would end and the offering would be made for each of them. Let's turn to Numbers 8, verse 6, please. Is, is there a double standard here? I mean, the Jews, I mean, they, they had the law. They had the, all the sacrifices. And, 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 and they were believers, yet they were still zealous for the law. And now Paul comes along and, and they say to him, yeah, we heard all these reports about you. Here, prove that they aren't true by doing this. And not only that, remember what we told the Gentiles, this is all they have to do. All they have to do is abstain from blood, from strangled, eating strangled meat, and from sexual immorality and, and a few other things. Idols. Meat sacrificed to idols. Is there a double standard? Should there be a double standard? I was ha having fun with the hand sanitizer station just a little bit earlier. But that was a huge part in the Jewish custom. And we'll get to that later. They were zealous about performing, washing their hands. As we look at the purification rites that Paul was asked to participate in, I want to look at the consecration of the Levites that were set apart for to have a special standard of purity over the rest of the Israelites. And it looks like a double standard. But God had an order and a purpose for the Levites in an orderly way that God chose for them to be the religious leaders. As we read this Numbers 8, 6, <coughs> It's pretty extensive purification. In verse 6 it says, Take the Levites among the other Israelites and make them ceremonially clean. To purify them, do this. Sprinkle the water of cleansing on them. Then have them shave their whole bodies and wash their clothes and so purify themselves. You know, purification when a little further for these Levites than a hand sanitation station as you walk into the temple. There was a whole bunch of stuff that they had to do in order to be pure, in order to serve God with the sacraments and, and lead the people and be priests for the rest of Israel. 
In Acts 21, Paul had his head shaved and started the process of purification. It may have been a Nazarite vow, because Paul was not a Levite. But there are all kinds of ceremonies, washings, offerings, and sacrifices that are, that are very detailed in how they should be performed, when they should be performed in the Old Testament and the customs of the law. And these new believing Jews that Paul said, I mean that, that the, the believers, James and the believers said, thousands of believers were zealous for the law. Now how, how do you, how do you consecrate yourself? How do you separate and purify yourself from unbelievers? You certainly don't come to me or a designated priest to be sprinkled and, and make a vow and shave your whole body. It's not what we do, but we show some zeal. Ask yourself this question. How do you show zeal? How do you show zeal for God and his law. The thousands of Jewish believers were zealous for the law. When I read this, I couldn't find any negative vibe associated with the statement. The zeal must have been more than skin deep. In fact, Paul, as a Jew, is encouraged to take part in the law to show that he was in obedience to the law. And Paul obliges with no qualm. You know, God laid out a special standard for the Levites set apart from Israel. Now, after Jesus fulfilled the law, could there still have been a special standard for Jews above the Gentile believers? If there is no special standard, then why are we not going through some purification rites of our own? right now, like Paul did. Verse 25 that we read from, from Acts 21, it said, as for the Gentile believers, we have written to them our decision that they should abstain from food sacrificed to, for, to idols, from blood, from meat strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. You know, in that basic charge to the Gentile believers, there's no mention of ceremonially ritualistic purification in this decision. Remember what Paul said in our scripture reading this morning again. It is fine to be zealous, provided the purpose is good, and to be so always, not just when I am with you. Please, let's turn to Galatians 1, 11. Real zeal is real good. Real zeal originates from the heart. You know, there are certain people that may get you excited about God. But God should get you excited about Him. It's easy to be on fire for God in the church. People can carve out, you know, a two-hour segment of their lives or of their week and say, Man, I, I can be zealous for God for two hours. I can sing hymns to Him for two hours. But as soon as we get out that door, and as soon as my, my sister or brother gets the window seat, that zeal's done, man. I'm finished. What about when the wife burns the meal again? What about when the husband comes home late again? The boss, the parent, the teacher, or the spouse yells at you for no reason again. Where is your zeal for God then? Real zeal is always. Let me repeat that. Real zeal is always. Not only when the right people are present, but when God is present with you and in you. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus now. Give me Jesus tomorrow. 
Give me Jesus for the rest of my life. Always with me. So that I can carry that zeal for Him in my life. You know, Paul explains his transition from bad zeal to good zeal. In Galatians 1, 11, he says, I want you to know, brothers, that the gospel I preached is not something that man made up. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my precious my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many Jews of my own age and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when God, who set me apart from birth and called me by His grace, was pleased to reveal His Son in me so that I might preach Him among the Gentiles, I did not consult any man. Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was. But I went immediately into Arabia and later returned to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Peter and stayed with him 15 days. Now Paul explained that his zeal did not come from any man, but by God. By real zeal, I mean the real zeal. God chose Paul. God revealed his son where? Where did God reveal his, his son? Was it out there by man? It was in him. God revealed his son in him. When you go about being zealous, where does that zeal start? Who starts it? It is started by God's grace. Now that's the way it always was. God chose the Israelites before He ever gave them the law to be zealous over. God chose you by His grace so that His Son may be revealed in you. The zeal, the real zeal, is the response to that wonderful grace. The real zeal is a continual, night and day, week after week, month after month, year after year of Jesus expressing himself in you. Even when the brother or sister gets the window seat. Or the front seat. Even when there's no one around you. And you're sitting in front of the TV or the computer. Even when the ones you are around are zealous for ungodly things. We talked about the Jews possibly being set apart for the law, being zealous for the law. While the Gentiles passively avoided the basic no-nos in life. No, God has set every believer apart to be zealous for Him. God's love in the heart will be a law to be zealous over. Looking forward to the next chapter in Galatians. Galatians 2, starting with verse 15. Should be real close to there. Paul says, We who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners... Know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ, and not by observing the law. Because by observing the law, no one will be justified. You know, true, true zeal is based on truth. You know, a person can follow the law and be zealous for the law and be zealous for God. And it can be a good thing to be zealous for the, God, for the law. But they have to realize the place of the law. It's not there for justification. It's not there to, once you get them all checked off, of course, by checking them off, usually it's, I failed that one. I failed that one. I failed that one. 
And we get to murder, and, and he said, man, I don't think I failed that one. And Je Jesus says, if you call your brother a fool, you're in danger of hellfire. I better check that one, too. If you hate your brother, you're a murderer. And so we get this law. Are we zealous over it? Without Christ, the law is a curse. And it imprisons. It shows God's holy standard and it points to the one whom that perfect standard was completed, satisfied and fulfilled. Through this knowledge, you can have a healthy zeal for the law. Please, let's turn to Romans 10. The one, Jesus, who enters our lives through belief as we empty it of our ways, selfishness and sins, free us <coughs> and frees you from the imprisonment of the curse. You should be enthusiastic about this. You should be zealous for this. And man, woohoo! I'm free. I don't have to meet all those standards because Jesus did it for me. But not in a zealous way to say, now I can break them all like Moses did that day. I can follow them with a newness of life, with a newness of Christ living in me. It's not me following them. It's Jesus Christ, His power living in me and being revealed in me. He transforms you to be like himself. Like Paul, this process is not an outward influence of the men from Jerusalem or anywhere else. It is a zeal that Jesus brings to the wilderness of your soul. It's a true zeal that loves God and desires to please him always by a zeal for obedience to his law, statutes, and commands. You know, looking at zeal, can you grasp the difference between good zeal and bad zeal? Do you understand it? I mean, sometimes it's pretty shady. The good purposes are based on truth. Good purposes and the ever-present influence of Jesus in your life. In Romans 10, starting with verse 1, it says, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God. But their zeal is not based on knowledge. Since they did not know the righteousness that comes from God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Christ is the end of the law, so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. I'm going to skip down to verse 9. That if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. As the Scripture says, anyone who trusts in Him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on Him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved is a quote from the Old Testament in the book of Joel. And it's quoted over and over again. Paul, Peter quoted it in his first time when he preached after, on the day of Pentecost. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It starts from in here. It's not your power. It's not your zeal. It's not your effort. It's Jesus Christ living in you. And even, let's, let's turn to Mark 7, 5, please. The double standard also of the Jew and the Gentile is taken away here. There's no difference between them. Salvation has always been through grace. Zeal to serve and obey God follows His work. You know, you can miss the goodness of zeal by being conformed by laws. 
conformed by rituals or trying to conform to them. Preferences. Or even a sin earnest, sincere desire to please men or even God. <coughs> but confirmation is just whitewash on right rottenness. And believe me, when you start trying to paint that whitewash on right rottenness, it doesn't work. Not on you, and not when you try to paint it on somebody else. Because the rottenness just keeps coming out. Unless that zeal is inside. Unless Jesus Christ is inside. Don't even try to obey the law. Because you're going to mess up. And it's going to show. Jesus transforms from the inside. He heals from the inside. When he healed the paralyzed man who was dropped from the ceiling in the presence of all this crowd, Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. That's where it starts. And then the whole man came later. Get up out of that bed and start walking. The thousands of Jewish believers were zealous for the law. They were probably transformed this way. Their sins were forgiven. They had believed in Jesus Christ. And that zeal for the law was in awe of His work in and through their lives and His work on the cross. That's why they were zealous for the law. You know, Paul, he certainly had Christ in him as he performed those rituals, as he shaved his head, he paid for that, and went through the process of purification. It wasn't the purification made him pure, it was Jesus Christ in him that made him pure. You know, we'll look more in the passage of Mark as Jesus explains the importance of the condition of the heart versus the outward appearance. In Mark 7, 5. So the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, Why don't your disciples live according to the traditions of elders instead of eating their food with unclean hands? He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to the traditions of men. Let's go down to verse 15, please. Nothing outside a man can make him unclean by going into him. Rather, it is what comes out of a man that makes him unclean. And then go down to verse 21. He went on. What comes out of a man is what makes him unclean. For from within, out of men's hearts, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and make a man unclean. And that's the zeal. That's the bad zeal. And you don't know how many times people try to dress it up. And it's worthless. Unless it comes from within. True zeal is God working in your heart. It is not conforming to the extreme positive environment of church. It is the continual transformation of the heart through confession, belief, and obedience. Now let the zeal you have be driven away from the list we just read. You know, evil thoughts. That's not, that's not zeal. Not the zeal. Sexual immorality. That's not the zeal. Theft. That's not the zeal. Murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. You know, if we could, if we could change those things... And say, hey, this is this is this is what the zeal is. We could take those evil thoughts 
and we say, good thoughts. We could take that sexual immorality and say, when that sexual immorality hits us in the face, you know, whether it's lust or whether it's temptations or whatever, like, God, I just want to be pure. I want to be pure. Give me your word. I need your word. <coughs> Replace that with you. Theft. You know, a lot of times we think of theft as taken from one another. <coughs> well, the opposite of that is generosity. God, help me to be zealous. I need to, to be zealous for you. And, and I need to give away with the things that I am so zealous for. In the Old Testament, it talks about stealing from God. And it wasn't like going into his church and taking out of the offering plate. It was, it was withholding the tithe. Holding, withholding what belongs to God. That was theft. Generosity. Generosity to the poor. Generosity to, to the needy. Generosity to God's work. When we get to murder, the opposite of murder, I think, is salvation. We have the message of salvation. We have the message to give life. We can tell people, Jesus died for you. And if we withhold that message, then we may as well murder him. Because we're sending them to a Christless eternity without the option of ever getting that option of the life. Adultery. Adultery comes in many ways. Are we committed to Christ? Are we committed to one another in love? Greed. Contentment. Are you content? I was asked a question, my track team said, if, if you could have a choice between world peace or Donald Trump's wealth, what color would you, your Lamborghini be? And I told them, you know what, we're never going to get world peace. And I didn't give them a color. I says, I'm content and I'm happy with exactly where I'm at in my life. I want to be here. I want to I want to be this age. I want my wife, she's the most beautiful person in this world. Everything I have is awesome. So I don't have a color. Contentment. Malice. And then malice is trying to destroy somebody. And I think a balance to that is definitely love, building one, one another, encouragement and edification. And then we get to deceit, truth. Just open up your life. You know, I, I admit I messed up, I'm a sinner. You know, someday we're all going to be exposed before God anyways. We may as well not try to hide it in this world. Truth. Lewdness. Graciousness. Let's be gracious. Let's be zealous and be gracious to one another. Envy. Joy. Be happy. <laughs> Not just happy because of the happy things around you, but, but be joyous because Jesus Christ died for your sins. We're all going to heaven. Those of us that have believed. And that should get us going every single day. So when you think about these, these thoughts of anger or whatever, envy, think about what you have.
slander. Again, encouragement, edification, arrogance, humility. Who are we? We're nothing but a pile of proteins. Someday, 30 years down the road, 50 years down the road, at least 90 years down the road, all of us can be dust. Anyway, be humble. And then we got uh, folly, wisdom. Just be wise. May your zeal be the zeal of Christ in you. Let's pray.